Thank you very much. From time to time, we all ask deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? How can we give meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, some people have answers to these questions. For example, morality is dictated by God and holy scriptures. When everyone obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. Or the world's problems are the fault of evil people who must be defeated and punished. Or one tribe is inherently worthy. It should be, have power and prestige embodied in a strong leader who channels its authentic virtue. Or in the past, there was a well-ordered state. Then alien forces subverted this harmony and led to decadence and degeneration. Only a heroic vanguard with memories of the old ways can restore the society to its golden age. Okay, but what about the rest of us? In my forthcoming book, um, I argue that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, namely the ideals of the Enlightenment, uh, also known as classical liberalism or the open society, namely that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing, that problems are inevitable, but problems are solvable given the right knowledge. Solutions create new problems which are solvable in their turn. Now, many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. They are like the Moliere character who was delighted to learn that he had been speaking prose all his life. As a result, the ideals of the Enlightenment tend to fade into the background. They become the status quo or the establishment Whereas other ideologies have passionate advocates, I suggest that Enlightenment values, uh, too, need a positive defense and an explicit commitment. That is what I have tried to do. The Enlightenment is based on four themes, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason. Reason is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you try to argue that you're right, that other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of baloney, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. Now, humans on their own are not particularly reasonable. Cognitive psychologists have shown that members of our species are prone to generalize from anecdotes, we seek confirming evidence and we blow off disconfirming evidence. We project stereotypes onto individuals and we're overconfident about our knowledge, our wisdom, and our rectitude. But people are capable of reason if they establish certain norms and institutions, such as free speech, open debate and criticism, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing. Which brings me to the second Enlightenment ideal, science. The conviction that the world is intelligible, that we can understand it by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Now, science is our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important Enlightenment ideal is that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable, just like any other hypotheses about the world. The third ideal is humanism, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of men, women, uh, and children, and to uh, other sentient uh, non-human creatures as well. Well, that sounds pretty bland and unexceptionable, even banal, but in fact, there are alternatives to humanism. For example, the belief that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe, the nation, the race, the class, or the faith to achieve feats of heroic greatness, to advance a mystical force or dialectic or struggle or uh, to pursue a utopian or messianic age, or to obey the dictates of a divinity and pr pressure others to do the same. Now, humanism is feasible because we humans are endowed with a sense of sympathy, an ability to, <coughs> to value the well-being of other creatures. Now, by default, 
our circle of sympathy is rather narrow. We feel the pain of our blood relatives, our friends, our allies, and cute little fuzzy baby animals, and that's about it. However, our circle of sympathy can be expanded through forces of cosmopolitanism, through education, journalism, art, mobility, and even reason, the understanding that there I can't privilege my interests over yours and expect you to take me seriously because there is nothing special about me just because I'm me and you're not. Well, the fourth Enlightenment ideal is progress. The expectation that if we apply knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. So, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? Well, if you ask intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because I have learned that intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. I have been, if you think that we can solve problems, I have been told, then you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader for vulgar American can-doism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss after the Voltaire character who declared that all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Well, I believe that we should Treat progress not as a uh, disposition or an attitude or a character type, but as an empirical hypothesis. That dimensions of human flourishing can be measured. Life, health, sustenance, wealth, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Well, let's take a look at, at some of the numbers, starting with life itself. For most of human history, Life expectancy was parked at about uh, 30, a little bit higher, a little bit lower in various times and places. But since the Industrial Revolution and then the Public Health Revolution of the 19th century, uh, first Europe uh, made the great escape from early death, so that the average life expectancy at birth of a European today is 80, uh, an increase of more than 50 years. And in a pattern that we see repeatedly when we look at progress, other parts of the world got a later start, but have closed the gap. Here you have life expectancy for the United States, for uh, uh, um, an Asian country, for um, Africa, and here we have the figure for the world as a whole. Today, the life expectancy at birth for an average person on Earth is 71 years. Uh, it used to be that <clears throat> in even the richest countries, one-third of children died before they reached their fifth birthday. Here we have Sweden with a 33% child mortality rate in 1750. They brought it down to very close to zero, a trajectory that then was followed by uh, Canada, by uh, South Korea, by uh, Chile, and uh, thrillingly, this gap is being closed, so even the parts of the world where health is poorest, namely sub-Saharan Africa, the rate of child mortality has plummeted. The same is true of mater maternal mortality. For most of human history, about 1% of women died in childbirth. That was brought down first in Sweden, United States, uh, Mal Malaysia, uh, and uh, once again, we now see sub-Saharan Africa closing the gap. Health has increased in just about every dimension. The infectious disease, which is the greatest killer of children in the developing world, um, has been brought down. The five most dangerous diseases have all shown significant declines in the last two decades, including pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, uh, measles, and HIV AIDS. Sustenance. Famine was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and it was a unpredictable uh, mass killer throughout human history. But starting with the agricultural revolution in England in the uh, 18th and 19th century, the number of calories available per person uh, increased steadily, followed by the United States, France, then uh, much more recently China, 
uh, India, and here you have the figure for the world as a whole. Now you might say, are these extra calories just making rich people fatter? Uh, the answer is no. If you look at measures of malnutrition, such as childhood stunting, uh, for some time quite low in the United States, but it has been uh, decreasing in every part of the world, including Colombia, um, China, uh, uh, Kenya, and Bangladesh. Uh, as a result of the availability of calories, famine deaths have been radically decreasing over the last century. Famine used to uh, strike every part of the world. Now it is confined to a couple of pockets in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Prosperity. For most of human history, virtually everyone was dirt poor. Then, starting with the Industrial Revolution, um, England made the great escape from universal poverty, and re replicating the pattern that we have seen elsewhere, followed by the United States, more recently uh, South Korea, Chile, and uh, still more recently China and India are showing exponential growth. Uh, and there you have the graph for the world as a whole. As a result, uh, extreme poverty is being decimated. Extreme poverty defined as uh, the uh, not having enough uh, income to feed your family for uh, a given day. Uh, it used to be that 90% of the world met the definition for extreme poverty. That was true just two centuries ago. Uh, today, the figure is 10%, and the United Nations has set the Sustainable Development Goal of eliminating extreme poverty everywhere on Earth by the year 2030, a year that many of us will, uh, will, will uh, see arrive. Uh, <clears throat> because of this development, for all the talk of increased inequality within wealthy countries, inequality in the world as a whole has been decreasing because the poor are getting richer faster than the rich are getting richer. Among wealthy countries, as they get richer, they devote an increasing proportion of their wealth to helping the needy. For most of European history, approximately 1% of GDP was spent on the poor, the sick, the aged, and on children. Starting in the 20th century, that increased in every developed country. Here you have uh, France, Italy, uh, Sweden, and so on. So that now a average member of the OECD devotes 22% of its GDP to be redistributed to children, the elderly, the poor, and the sick. Thanks to this uh, social spending, uh, poverty has been uh, decreasing, even as inequality has been increasing. In the United States, if you look at disposable income, that is how, not just what people have on their paycheck, but how much they receive in uh, government benefits, then poverty has been uh, uh, in a uh, radical decrease since the 1960s. If you look at consumption, what people can actually afford to buy, the food, clothing, and shelter, the rate of poverty decreased from 30% in 1960 to 3% today. Peace. For most of human history, war was the background state of affairs, and peace was a mere respite between wars. You can see that in this graph, which shows the percentage of years in which the great powers of the day, the, most, the largest states and empires, were at each other's throats in war. Uh, 500 years ago, the great powers were pretty much always at war. Uh, today, they are almost never at war. The last great power war pitted the United States against North Korea in, uh, and, and uh, China in 1953. If we now zoom in on the period since World War II, we see that rates of death in all wars have uh, undergone a roller coaster with a downward trajectory with peaks for the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War, and most recently the Syrian Civil War. But even with that horrific war, the rate of death in wars of all kinds is a fraction today of what it was in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, and the 50s. Freedom and rights have been on the increase despite conspicuous setbacks in places like Turkey and Russia. Uh, the world has never been more democratic than it is today. We also see this in the decline of barbaric government practices, such as uh, the death penalty. Uh, country after country has abolished the death penalty, so that if current trends continue, the death penalty will vanish from the face of the earth by 2026. 
Now, the United States, with this and with, uh, I must say, many other trends, is something of a, a backwater, an outlier among wealthy democracies. But even in the United States, capital punishment is a shadow of its former self, as you can see by the per capita rate of executions in the United States since colonial times. Uh, homosexuality used to be a crime in virtually every country, but country after country has decriminalized it, again, again despite uh, a couple of um, instances of backsliding. And child labor has been in steady decline. It used to be that uh, all children were put to work. Uh, England and the United States abolished child labor uh, about a century ago, followed by uh, Italy, and uh, in the world as a whole we see substantial declines. We have been getting safer. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, the rate of homicide in European countries was about 50 per 100,000 per year. This is, but then it, it has been, since been brought down to less than one per 100,000 per year in England, Netherlands, and Belgium, and Italy. Later, this pattern was replicated in uh, the New World when New England brought its homicide rate together. The American Wild West, uh, had high rates of personal violence, which were then brought down. And um, our host country, Mexico, which is uh, sadly uh, infamous for high rates of homicide. Uh, but Mexico used to have a rate of homicide in the 1930s that was five times higher uh, than it is today. And many parts of Mexico have seen declines in, in uh, rates of violent death. If we now just zoom in on the last 50 years or so, we see that the United States, again an outlier in, among other Western democracies, has cut its homicide rate in half. England has seen a reduction. The world as a whole has seen a 30% reduction in homicide just in the last 20 years. And there is a proposal, quite realistic, for the world to cut its homicide rate by 50% in the next 30 years by following uh, best practices. Other forms of violence have also been in decline. Here we see that the United States has had an 80% reduction in the rate of violence against women, both domestic violence and rape and sexual assault. There have been declines in violence against children, such as victimization of children at school and bullying, and rates of physical abuse and sexual abuse by caregivers. We've become much safer on, on the road. We're 96% less likely to be killed in a car accident compared to a century ago. Uh, pedestrians are 88% less likely to be mowed down on the sidewalk. We're 99% less likely to be killed in a plane crash. 59% less likely to fall to our deaths. 92% less likely to be burned to death. 90% less likely to drown. 92% less likely to be asphyxiated. However, there is one category that has increased, what epidemiologists call poison, solid, or liquid. This is not because people are drinking bleach or eating uh, roach powder, but here you see the effects of the uh, opioid epidemic. Occupational accident deaths have uh, plummeted by 95%. Deaths in natural disasters, like earthquakes, floods, and droughts, have been uh, uh, dra drastically reduced. Finally, what about the quintessential act of God, the unpredictable date with death, the literal bolt out of the blue. Well, it turns out that we are 97% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. <laughs> Knowledge has been increasing through most of European history. Uh, about uh, one person in eight knew how to read or write. But then starting in the, uh, around the time of the Enlightenment, the rate of literacy increased to 100% in countries like Netherlands, later uh, in England, uh, then Germany, uh, Italy, and uh, the United States. More recently, that has been replicated in China uh, and in the world, in uh, Africa and in the world as a whole. So today, more than 80% of the world's population is literate. The ones who are illiterate are mostly in their 80s and 90s. Among people under 25, more than 90% of uh, people are literate. Likewise, most of the world has a basic education. Here you have the trajectory for uh, the English-speaking countries, Western Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, East Asia, uh, Latin America, the Middle East, 
South and East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Most of the world today has a basic education. There you have the graph for the world as a whole. And perhaps most astonishing of all, we have been getting smarter. In a phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, IQ scores have been increasing by three points a decade for a century. How has this been reflected in the quality of our lives? Well, in both Western Europe and the United States, people work 22 fewer hours a week than they did in the era of Bob Cratchit and uh, Dickens' The Christmas Carol. Thanks to the spread of running water, of electricity, of wa washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, uh, stoves, and microwaves, the amount of time that we devote to housework has been reduced by 43 hours of, uh, a week. And when I say uh, we, for most of human history, that meant women, and much of the liberation of women was enabled by this decimation of demands of housework. Thanks to this, leisure time has increased, both for men and for women. This decrease over here uh, occurs because women have been spending more time with their children. A working woman today spends more time with her children than a stay-at-home mom did in the 1950s. Uh, thanks to the um, declining cost of goods and rising salaries, we spend less of our paychecks on necessities. In 1920, people spent two-thirds of their paycheck on food, clothing, and shelter. Now it is one-third. Well, is any of this making us any happier? And the answer is yes. Here you have a regression line for the happiness of different countries as a function of their GDP per capita. That is, as countries get richer, uh, their people get happier. This is plotted on a log scale, so you have to get much, much richer if you're already rich for your people to get uh, still happier. And this cloud of arrows shows that it is not just that rich countries are happier, but within each country, richer people are happier. So as the world gets richer, people are expected to get happier. Well, I've shown you a number of quantitative demonstrations of human progress. How has this been reflected in the news? Well, I'm going to show you one more graph, and this shows the emotional tone of the news over the last 70 years. Here you have the tone of the New York Times. Here we have a sample of news outlets from across the world. So as you can see, as the world has been getting better and better and better, the news has been getting more and more and more negative. So why do people deny progress? One answer comes from cognitive psychology. The, uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman have shown that people assess risk by a shortcut called the availability heuristic. That is, they estimate probability according to how easily they can recall examples from memory. If you combine that with the nature of the news, remembering that news is about stuff that happens, not stuff that doesn't happen or that happens slowly. You never see a reporter saying, I am reporting live from a country that is not at war or a city that has not had a terrorist attack. Well, you combine those uh, with the news policy, if it bleeds, it leads, and you'll get the impression that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been, even when the data show that the world uh, has, uh, uh, is uh, safer, healthier, and more prosperous. There is also a well-known aspect of our psychology called the negativity bias, summarized by the slogan, bad is stronger than good. We think about and feel bad events more than uh, good, one, good events. And there's a kind of gravitas market that pessimism sounds serious, optimism sounds frivolous. As uh, one commentator noted, uh, pessimists sound like they're trying to help you. Optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. <laughs> now, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. Solutions create new problems which have to so be solved in their uh, turn. And we can always be blindsided by nasty surprises. The world wars, the 1960s crime boom, the AIDS epidemic in Africa, and opioid overdoses among middle-aged, non-educated uh, whites in the United States. Also, there are severe global challenges, such as climate change and nuclear war, which are unsolved, though I would suggest that even those are, in principle, solvable. Here you see that the world has been on a trajectory of decarbonization, that uh, we 
emit less CO2 per dollar of GDP. This is true in the UK, first US, uh, China, um, India, and then the world as a whole. And few people are aware that the world's nuclear stockpile has decreased by 85%. Now, again, these are not enough to stave off co uh, co potential catastrophe, but they show that the, there are curves moving in the, in the right direction, which we can accelerate if we uh, put our minds to it. So progress is not a law of nature, I suggest, but a gift of the ideals of the enlightenment, of reason, science, and humanism. If we commit ourselves to those ideals, there is a reasonable hope of future progress, and uh, if we don't, uh, it won't. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephen, uh, listening to some people, and you mentioned that there are not surprises that it could happen, a nuclear war or climate change or whatever. What is really your concern? What, what worries you? What, what we should put attention to keep progress, mm -hmm. also, of course, in relation with, with using reason and based on science and et cetera, but also what could be like a concern that you could say, well, here we, will, we should put our resources and our thinking. I, I would begin with climate. Um, there, there, there are problems both from the left and, and the right. Uh, from the right, of course, there is the denial that it is a problem. Um, but from the left, there is an, uh, an unwillingness to do the math and figure out what could actually solve it. Uh, most obviously in the case of nuclear power, which is the world's most abundant and scalable force of carbon-free energy, but many sectors of the left are, I believe, irrationally uh, opposed to nuclear power, even though countries like Sweden have shown that economies can decarbonize. Also from the left, there is, I think, the myth that we should undo the Industrial Revolution, return to nature, have a more sustainable, simpler lifestyle. Uh, none of us are uh, prepared to do that, and there's no the way that we're going to get the developing world to forego all the benefits that we have enjoyed. So I think a combination of technological advances in next generation nuclear power, advances in car carbon capture and storage, because we have to not just stop emitting CO2, but uh, re reduce the amount that's already out there. So I would put that number one, and I think looking at the worst case scenarios, then uh, a, a more stable world in terms of nuclear threats is also uh, high on the list. I agree. Un aplauso, por favor. Steven Pinker, thank you very much. Thank Gracias. you.